as the U.S. Congress draws attention to the race with China to land the next people on the moon, and as SpaceX draws attention to development of the Starship system they expect to be the dominant beyond Earth orbit transportation system before too long, those spotlights continue to reflect on NASA's planned lunar landing on the Artemis III mission. Hey everyone, welcome back. Even as SpaceX remains committed to their Mars plans, they won the contract to land the next Americans on the moon. And right now they continue to forecast landings of Starship in both places, the moon and Mars, in as little as two years from now. But those schedules continue to be delayed while China says their goal is still to land the first Taikonauts on the moon by the end of the decade. There are a few notes about other Artemis news, but in another slow news week overall, this is going to be the next in a series about Artemis 3, as the race to the moon turns into a race between Starship and China. The race that the U.S. Congress is trumpeting to land the next people on the moon is turning into a relay race with China, with Starship as a critical anchor leg for the NASA team. Whether Artemis attempts a lunar landing on Artemis 3 or another mission, and whether SLS and Orion transport the U.S. crew to the moon for the landing attempt, or a commercial alternative does, as the back half of the decade begins to speed towards its end, the lunar landing race looks like it boils down to a race between SpaceX to finish Starship development and China to finish developing their lunar architecture. The Artemis III mission has been baselined as a lunar landing mission since the Artemis brand name was coined in 2019, and right now SLS and Orion would run the first legs of the relay race and then hand the baton to Starship in lunar orbit for the anchor leg to the lunar surface. There are preliminaries before that race can start, though. Exploration ground systems, Orion and SLS, have to complete Artemis II and accomplish the test objectives of that mission. Although they are working to fly sooner, there's still a lot of work ahead, and the launch is still officially targeted for next April, which itself is now only 10 months away. Starship will also anchor those Artemis III pre-flight preliminaries with critical technology demonstrations. The Starship Lunar Lander is based on an architecture that includes high-frequency launches and propellant refueling in Earth orbit. SpaceX has to demonstrate both propellant transfer and an uncrewed lunar landing before Artemis III, and Starship also has to complete the HLS critical design review for the option A lander in between. So before SLS launches Artemis III with Orion and crew, there are a lot of milestones that haven't been accomplished yet, and any issues that come up during all the upcoming test flights will have to be addressed. Once all of those pre-flight tests are complete, Starship will anchor the Artemis III preparations. While Orion and SLS are being stacked on the ground, SpaceX will be launching a dozen or so Starship tankers into low Earth orbit to a depot Starship. They will also have to launch the HLS vehicle several weeks ahead of time as a part of those pre-flight preparations. After the HLS vehicle is refueled by additional tankers at the depot, it will transit to the Gateway's near-rectilinear halo orbit to complete its Artemis III preparations. If Artemis III flies and successfully lands on the moon in 2027 or 2028, that's still well earlier than China's currently announced plans for an initial crewed lunar landing before 2030, which would be essentially by the end of 2029 or by the end of this decade. Their lunar orbit rendezvous architecture is a dual launch architecture using the Long March 10 rocket in development. That reportedly has a similar translunar injection performance as the SLS Block 1 vehicle, around 27 metric tons of payload through TLI. The Long March 10 rocket would send their Lanyu lunar lander to the moon on one vehicle, and then their Mengzhou crewed spacecraft on another. The crew in Mengzhou would rendezvous and dock with the lunar lander there, and then two of them would descend in the lunar lander from orbit to the surface. Those two launches would perhaps be the fourth and fifth launches, with three precursor test flights, one of those being with a crew. Recently, their government announced they plan to conduct abort tests of the Mengzhou system, one for a pad abort case and one for an in-flight abort. Even with the long-range stated goals, it's getting increasingly difficult to get guidance from the public and the private programs on their status and outlook today. 
Less is provided and there are fewer opportunities in public to ask about development plans and status. For some of the programs, we have an old roadmap of the past plans and schedules because they've gone through that process before. For the programs that are pathfinding, like lunar development for SpaceX and China, their work is either proprietary secrets or Chinese government secrets. And so there are fewer ways to measure progress. It mostly comes down to trying to interpret the outcome of a flight test and extrapolate from that. As we've seen around the last three Starship flight tests, the outcome is subject to a varying range of varying interpretations. The U.S. would still seem to be ahead if the Chinese are targeting the end of 2029. There's still a lot of work to do, though, to win the race that Congress is publicizing. It's likely that Artemis III will be delayed again, but hard to say what a realistic date would be. If we look at what's left on the plate for the Artemis III programs, the legacy government programs that are on the White House chopping block, EGS, Orion, and SLS, they still have big milestones to complete. Artemis II will be the program's first crewed launch and test flight, which are planned to demonstrate that they are ready for subsequent crewed missions into lunar orbit. They still have a lot of work to do to finish launch preparations, and after the mission, there is a detailed post-flight review process. In parallel with all that work going on today, Orion and SLS are working to complete production of the remaining Artemis III flight hardware. And then EGS, Orion, and SLS will have to turn around and do this again to get the Artemis III vehicle ready to fly. Axiom Space is finishing development of their lunar surface spacewalk suits. They need to finish qualification of the suits for production, and they have a CDR in front of them too. Then they will need to furnish flight units for Artemis III that will fly with the Starship HLS vehicle and certify them before launch. The focus on the Starship schedule is because SpaceX has a much more ambitious amount of work to complete, all of which they will be doing for the first time when they get there. They have a significant amount of people working at a faster tempo than the government, but they also have three big demonstrations, or maybe two and a half demonstrations they need to complete before Artemis III can fly. And then the other half would be a part of that mission. Setting aside crew rating Starship and the ubiquitous risks that need to be taken into account for that, the propellant transfer demo is more ambitious than Artemis II. It involves at least two launches, a rendezvous, prox ops, and docking, and then the propellant transfer itself. Once that mission is complete and HLS clears its critical design review, that would be followed by the uncrewed lunar landing demonstration, which will involve multiple launches of two or three Starship variants, between the HLS variant, one or more tankers, and presumably a depot variant. And then the HLS variant would be the first starship to transfer to lunar orbit and then descend and land on the surface. It would then execute ignition and startup for a lunar launch demonstration slash hop. And then after all that, SpaceX will need to mobilize and launch all the lunar landing equipment for the crew demo, which will include a fully outfitted crew tended HLS lander, a larger set of tanker launches, and maybe another depot launch. Overall, we don't know how many steps or how many flight tests are planned in between these major Artemis demonstrations. SpaceX is hardware rich, but they also have other priorities besides NASA and HLS. So we don't know how much of the production resources will be allocated to Mars infrastructure versus HLS. Both leverage in-space refueling and both could need that refueling at about the same approximate time. The next Mars transfer window is in late 2026, which is about the same deadline that HLS would have to complete its uncrewed lunar landing demo. There are much more frequent lunar launch opportunities though, so perhaps refueling one or more starships to fly to Mars would take precedence, since those opportunities are only available about every 26 months. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. The latest public schedule estimate that took into account historical trends and tendencies was conducted over 18 months ago for the HLS program's Key Decision Point C review. At the end of 2023, it was estimated with 70% joint confidence level that HLS would be in the Gateway orbit in February 2028, which would be another half year or so beyond the current mid-2027 target date. 
There have been a lot of developments since that estimate, though. Back at that time, the same February 2028 estimate forecast had the HLS Critical Design Review in August 2025, only a couple of months from now. The CDR was scheduled to be finished after reviewing the data from the first big Artemis demo, the ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer in low Earth orbit. NASA recently acknowledged that both the demo and the CDR have been pushed back to 2026. In a recent presentation to the SpaceX workforce at Starbase, Elon Musk gave Starship about a 50-50 shot at being ready by the time of the Mars transfer window in 2026, which implies that Starship HLS readiness by the June 2027 date published in the full fiscal year 2026 President's budget request could also be bounded by that 50-50 estimate. All these estimates from the different programs, corporations, and governments have little in the way of supporting evidence or details. If we look at the watch items for Artemis 3, they haven't changed much from 18 months ago when I started this channel, other than the dates being delayed. But out here in public, we still don't have much of a sense of how everyone is going to get from here to launching their lunar landing flights. It's June 2025, and as we'll be repeating a lot, we're only a couple of weeks from it being exactly two years until the middle of 2027, when Artemis 3 remains scheduled to launch. At this time, two years from now, in mid-June 2027, the crew and full mission-capable Starship HLS needs to be orbiting the moon, and Orion and SLS need to be ready to roll out to the pad for launch. The last time we reached launch minus two years, which was last September, I'd asked NASA via public affairs about when the flight crew for Artemis 3 would be announced. At that time, the response was that the space agency wanted to announce the four-person crew somewhere between two years to 18 months before the flight. So assuming that NASA and all the programs believe that the mid-2027 date is feasible, we could at least start wondering again about an Artemis 3 crew announcement beginning next month in July. In news and notes for the week, the news feed was basically quiet. NASA talked more about streamlining their social media footprint than anything else, but the agency hasn't necessarily empowered its communication staff to post more content. And the White House is still pushing to significantly slash the communication staff, which only leads to more questions about whether we will see them do more with less, or they are just building an excuse for more secrecy. In the meantime, Exploration Ground Systems continues to process the Artemis II SLS and Orion flight hardware at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Orion remains in the multi-payload processing facility where EGS spacecraft offline operations continues to load hazardous and non-hazardous commodities on board. SLS is stacked on Mobile Launcher 1 and Vehicle Assembly Building High Bay 3. EGS Integrated Operations and the Artemis launch team working in the adjacent launch control center are working through verification of the interfaces or connections between the rocket stages and between the rocket and ground systems. In the past month or so, stacking of the working elements of the SLS vehicle was completed, and Lockheed Martin finished final assembly of the Artemis II Orion and handed it over to EGS. Interface verifications of the SLS boosters and core stage are more or less complete now, and loading of the Orion service module hypergolic propellants was also recently completed. Looking ahead to the rest of June and July, EGS will continue to work on interface verification testing and functional checkouts. Before the ops plan was streamlined to a single rollout to the pad just before the launch date, SLS was going to make a special rollout before Orion stacking to conduct a tanking test. The integrated test and checkout activities get the vehicle and ground systems ready for tanking. The latest and current plan, though, is instead to stay in the VAV, stack Orion, and perform the full vehicle testing and checkout before that single rollout to launch pad 39B a few weeks before whatever the target launch date is at that time. Over in the MPPF, EGS will be working to finish commodity loading over the next six weeks or so. After the service module propellant loading, the next planned commodities were the cabin atmosphere gases into the four large tanks in the ESM consumable storage subsystem. Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs said at the end of the week that servicing of the Orion service module oxygen was in progress. 
That would be followed by thermal control system commodities for the coolant loops and radiators, the crew module prop system fluids, and eventually the liquid cooling garment fluid loop. Once that's complete, then the Artemis II flight crew will participate in a crew equipment interface test and suited ingress test in the MPPF before the spacecraft is moved to the launch abort system facility for stacking of the launch abort system and crew module encapsulation for launch. At the end of the day on Friday the 13th of June, NASA posted an article and a bunch of images about practice recovery exercises that Exploration Ground Systems held with the Department of Defense. The practices were held on June 11th and 12th off the coast of Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center to run through launch abort contingencies in real time. The Crew Module Test Article, or CMTA, was used for the Valent, or I thought I heard it pronounced Valiant, exercises. That acronym stands for End-to-End -end Mission Validation Event, or some part of that. One practice simulated recovering the crew and the Orion crew module after a pad abort. The second ran through the detailed coordinated procedures for search and rescue in a downrange ascent abort scenario. In addition to launch operations at Kennedy Space Center, Exploration Ground Systems is responsible for landing and recovery operations at the end of the mission. More to come on this in future videos, and next time, for the first time in a long time, an update on Bole. Thanks as always for watching. Like and subscribe if you find these videos informative and want to find out what's going on with Artemis every week. As usual, a big thanks to the members of this YouTube channel who are helping to make it possible to keep doing these videos. I am posting additional videos and more frequent updates if you're interested in joining. If you're willing to make a one-time donation to support what I do, I would really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me A Coffee page in the description. Thanks again and see you next time.